Another day, another chance for good old Jerry to get some work done. He's up bright and early. His mind is made up. Today, I'm going to finish my math HL study. And so he walks straight back to his bed, grabs his phone and scrolls away on TikTok. Jerry, don't you have a certain math HL to worry about? Eh, I'll do it later. Later ends up becoming an hour, two hours, three, four, five. Well, he just wasted his entire day. But hey, there's still tomorrow, right? Beer. The moment his alarm sounds, Bjorn is already out of bed, goes for a quick morning jog, eats his breakfast, and then spends the next few hours studying in deep, utter focus. Time is of the essence. Hence, his time is precious, way too precious for anything else, as he must get into his top university. Plus, Bjorn is dead set on getting a perfect 7 for his math HL. He said he would get a perfect level 7, and he must. So I remember when I took my first math HL exam, alright? The first one I took was on polynomials and I took it maybe like a week or so after starting the Math HL course with a little bit of knowledge into polynomials. And I remember getting a level six out of seven. So I wasn't that disappointed, but it was the second exam that completely screwed me over. Okay, this exam was on factorials, on permutations, on some proofs. And in that exam, I actually ended up getting a four out of seven. And I remember when I first saw that, there was part of me that felt extremely sad. Right, like, damn, I probably should have gotten a higher mark. I probably should have done better. I don't know if I'm going to get into my top university now, especially with a four in my math HL, given that I wanted to go into engineering. And then there was the other part of me that told me to wake up, to unleash the potential I had inside of me and go ahead and not only destroy this level four, but overachieve it and get a perfect level seven in math HL. And that's what I set off to do. I set off to get that perfect level seven. However, it turns out that the methods that I was using to get that level seven were completely wrong. All right. I was approaching math, not necessarily because I had bad distractions or bad flow. I was pretty well versed in understanding those executive functioning skills. But what I lacked more than anything was the correct strategy, the correct disproportionate tasks, right? As we talk about a lot, disproportionate leverage, doing certain tasks that give you massive output. I did not understand how to do that with the IB and with math. And by utilizing these strategies, I was able to not only overachieve my goal of getting a level seven in math, but I was also able to achieve my goals across all the other subject areas in the IB, getting a perfect 45, and then ultimately getting into my top university at UPenn Warden, doing the dual degree program here, the MNT program with the engineering school. And I'm saying this because I know how it feels to get that bad mark, right? To get that level four. It really sucked. Okay, and there's no other way to put it. It really sucked, especially if you tried, right? You probably know a few kids in your class who they're basically like, yeah, I'm gonna really try in this assignment, right? Maybe it's an English assignment. I'm really gonna actually try. And then guess what? They get the exact same mark or even they get a worse mark. I remember there was a kid in my school who he's like, yeah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to do the best I can. And then every single time he said that, it was kind of funny. Every single time he said that, he got a worse mark on his English exam. So let me ask you this. Will trying harder bridge that gap? Maybe it will, but is it the most effective strategy? All right, and one of the ways I like to view this is, is trying harder, is that really the best way moving forward, right? Is handing out participation trophies on how hard you try, right? How hard you participated. Is that really what separates the achievers from the ultra high achievers, right? The people who get that 45 score. All right, and I learned pretty quick and I was pretty happy that I ended up learning this just by doing my own research online. That math is actually one of the most gameable and simplest topics throughout the entire IB curriculum to get a perfect seven. Okay, it's math. And let me tell you why it's math. And it has something to do with the strategy and that strategy is called building up intuition, all right? And let me explain this by just giving you the strategy that I use to improve from a level four all the way up until a level seven. And it's through the following three step process that you're able to master this as well, okay? The first step is to spend 15 minutes pre-study. After I got that level four, I would, for every single one of my math classes, all right, maybe like 80% of the time, not every single one, but the majority of my math, cl math classes, before I got into that math course, I would spend literally 15 minutes pre-studying the content. All right, and let me explain exactly what that meant. That literally meant me going on YouTube while I was on the bus, okay? Maybe I downloaded a few YouTube videos with the YouTube premium. I went on YouTube on the bus and I just watched videos of people explaining the content that I was about to cover in class. Now you may ask, what exactly is the content we're gonna cover? Well, that's why you're in the IB. You're in a, in a standardized program, which means that there's a syllabus, something you can follow that actually outlines exactly what you're gonna study next. So what I suggest you to do, and this saved my grade really, was I planned out exactly what I was gonna cover tomorrow on my math course and then on the bus ride to school I would spend maybe like 10 to 15 minutes just watching some videos taking some notes getting a good understanding really thinking about the topic before I went into class which leads me on to my second bullet point that really changed my life 
and that is to actually pay attention to class. All right. And it's the third bullet point right here that got me from level four to level seven. But if you don't have these first two, meaning you're not pre studying and you're not paying attention to class, you're really not working on the fundamental skills that will allow you to reach that level seven with ease. All right. Because the goal here isn't necessarily to get that level seven, because I strongly believe that anyone can get the level seven with just sheer brute work ethic. All right. If you ask someone to work every single minute of their day on math, just 24 seven nonstop, right? Sacrifice their soul, sacrifice their social life, not get into a good university, right? Not do all these other things that are necessary, but just go hard nonstop on math. You're probably going to get a level seven. But the question is, is that the most effective way? And is that way going to almost guarantee or better said, increase the probability that I get into a top university? Probably not. So real quick, the second point was here to pay attention in class. This is absolutely crucial, right? Because there's a reason why you're in class and most students just completely throw this time away. And the biggest way they do this is by multitasking. Okay. Do not spend your time multitasking. I know it's very tempting, right? You're there in class, your teacher's talking about some tangent because some guy in the class wasn't paying attention. He asked some dumb question. And then you're kind of just there staring at the wall, not really knowing what's going on, not really caring, right? Because you're like, damn, all right, I'll just probably read through this later. And then what do you do? And then you open up your computer and then you start responding to emails or you open up your computer and you go on WhatsApp or you go open up your computer and start texting your friend or you start trying to work on your English essay that is due later that week or draft some ideas for your EE, all of this type of stuff. All right. It's a derivative of multitasking. And it, multitasking is an absolute killer to your productivity. Even if you think you're being more productive because you're ignoring what's actually being taught in class, what you're really doing, and this is where the real cost of multitasking is. The real cost of multitasking is not the ignoring you're doing, but it's the switching you're going to be doing between tasks because that has a cognitive cost. All right. It takes your brain a few seconds to actually switch tasks, number one, and then takes your brain multiple minutes to fully focus on the task at hand. Very interesting study. I suggest you search this up. It takes the human brain on average 23 minutes to get back into a state of focus after being distracted. So you can think of multitasking as a distraction away from what's actually being taught. And then if it takes you roughly 23 minutes to get back into that state of focus on what's being taught, you're basically wasting multiple minutes. Maybe it's not exactly 23 minutes, but you're wasting multiple minutes trying to re-understand and get yourself back on track with the conversation that is going on. You might not realize this, but subconsciously you are depriving yourself of potential gains you could be making, which is why I'm so passionate about saying absolutely no multitasking, just completely stay focused in class. If for whatever reason you don't want to be in that class, just get up and leave. All right. Sometimes I do this in university. If there's just no value being taught. In fact, I did it today. All right. In my CS 380 course, if I just felt like I was not getting much out of it and I would do much better doing my own research, maybe going back lectures, reading a few lecture notes, I literally just left class and then went to a quiet study room and started doing my own work there because that's so much more productive than trying to multitask. Craig, which I see all the time, especially in university and also in high school. And that leads me to my third strategy. Okay. This right here changed my life. And it's the following do as many past papers as possible. All right. Let me explain why this is fundamental and why, because of this math HL is the quote unquote gameable subject of the IB. What you're really trying to do with past paper questions. Okay is not necessarily to learn the content, all right? It's not necessarily to quote unquote study. The main reason why I do past paper questions, especially with math, is to build what I like to call intuition, which is that gut feeling that you need. Because you gotta understand that a lot of advanced math HL questions, especially the most difficult ones, they tend to utilize the concepts that are learned in class and they tend to twist it in a way that requires critical thinking. Right. Maybe you get an application of some type of permutation problem or some type of combinatorics or some type of integral that you've never seen before. Right. And you're supposed to try to figure it out on the spot and no amount of memorization, no amount of anything can help you with that problem. But intuition can. And the reason why intuition can is because it's that trigger in your brain that tells you, hey, I've seen this before. I've been here before. I recognize what is going on. And that intuition is, I mean, there's many ways to build it, but the most effective way that I built it, at least in my own life and with working with students now for the past five, six years is by doing as many past paper questions as humanly possible. You want to become an absolute machine with these past paper questions. And I think in the future, I'm going to actually release a video on how I do these past paper questions because there's a methodology behind it. Okay. I don't want you to just do these questions as slow as possible because that's what most people do. And then they focus on these not very important details. And then they keep doing parts of the questions that they already know, because that's, what's easy to do. Remember, if you do what's easy, your life will be hard, but if you do what's hard, your life will be easy. Instead of doing past paper questions like that, I like to just get into the question, identify exactly what point of the question requires me to critically think, right? Maybe it's a certain trick in the integral. Maybe it's a certain way to do the derivative. Maybe it's 
an aha moment in the induct in the induction proof or an aha moment in the combinatorics, what I try to do when I reach these past paper questions, and this is basically how all or the majority, at least the most difficult math HL questions are structured, is that there's some type of aha, there's some type of moment, there's some type of realization, some type of thing that you need to connect two dots. Every single time I approach past paper questions, I always approach it from the frame of where will I connect the two dots? And then I get to that point as fast as possible because all of the other stuff on the outside, right? Let's say you're simplifying a quadratic or let's say you're just doing some algebra. All of that stuff should be skills that you've already developed. The thing that makes a level seven student is the ability to identify merging these two dots, right? Critical thinking, that trick, however you want to call it, figuring that part out and then finding the solution. Long story short, I would just cram in as much as possible. And that really developed my intuition. Now, every single time I go and I see one of these IB paper questions or when I was studying for the exams, I could almost see what the IB instructor was trying to tell me. I, was, I almost saw the bullet point in the syllabus that they were trying to hit, right? The learning outcome with the critical thinking. So I cannot stress enough how you want to literally become a machine, right? Do as much as possible because there comes a point where quantity really just trumps quality, right? And the thing is that most people don't really know how to work. Most people don't understand how much volume is required to achieve success really in anything. Okay. And I think this is just something I'm still pretty young, right? I'm still in my twenties. I think this is something that I'm starting to learn in my own life, right? How much volume, how much of doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again is really required to achieve exceptional success. And it's much more than people think. And it's especially much more than most high school student thinks because most high school students have basically no experience at all with what it truly means to do an absurd amount of work. Okay. We just have no idea. And, and it's just a lack of experience. Okay. You're, you're, you're too young, whatever. I'm slowly starting to realize it. I think it's going to take me my entire life until I truly appreciate the nature of just doing a huge quantity of work. And then something you can actually do to build intuition even stronger is look at a question. And then before you do the question, ask yourself, what process at a high level, what I need to implement, what I need to do, how would I approach this question in order to complete it? Right? What would the solution look like? And then if you're able to vividly describe it, maybe you write down a step-by-step -step process of how to do that before you actually do the question itself, that can really frame yourself towards achieving the question. And then this is what's so excellent about these past paper questions. And this is really why I like the IB over, let's say some questions that your teacher gives you. Okay. And, and again, most people, they complain about the IB because they don't really know what the alternative is. Okay. The alternative of the IB is some dumb out of typically it's percent unstandardized school by school, which you don't really know what the solutions look like. It depends on the teacher. Might get a very good teacher, might get a very bad teacher. It's very unpredictable. The reason why I like the IB is because it's predictable. And when it's predictable, it's gameable. And again, the IB is doing everything it can to not be gameable. But myself, I just did tons of past paper questions. There were even times where I was doing the same past paper question. Like I did a few of the same ones. Some of those, there's some of those polynomial questions that I've done like 10, 10 to 15 times. The induction questions, I've done all of those like at least like 15 times. It's, it's kind of funny actually, but it reaches a point where you just start to just so thoroughly understand where they're coming at you from this type of thing that you literally just become invincible when it comes to the time to actually do the exam. All right. And it takes less effort than most people think, because if you just do it consistently, that's what builds long-term memory. That's what builds intuition, right? Most people are not willing to do it consistently and said they want some solution, some cram or the few hours before the exam, which again is not a good idea because you need fresh sleep. But anyways, you write down the question and then you look at the answer. All right. And you ask yourself, was my answer correct? And this is one of the biggest takeaways I had when it came to doing these past paper questions. You want to look at not only the answer that you got, but also the other answers that are available, right? This is huge when it comes to economics paper one. Okay. If anyone out there is doing economics paper one, pay attention to this because in econ paper one, there are where they had tons of different solutions, tons of different ways to answer the essay question, right? To answer the eight, I believe it was eight point to answer the eight point questions. They had tons of different ways to answer them. Okay. Tons of different solutions, tons of different methods, tons of acceptable answers and macro policies and international policies and all these types of policies that could work to answer the question. Okay. They had maybe like 15 or 10, 10 to 15 different ways to answer the question, which I thought it was just so brilliant because I could look at the mark scheme for economics paper one. And then I could redo the question again with the objective of writing it from that lens in mind. And the thing that I loved so much about it is that the answer was just like one sentence. It was just like this policy X, Y, and Z, right? You can use, I don't know, mon monetary policy. And then you could also use fiscal policy, but from this perspective, I can go about developing that by my own. And again, identify the key parts of the question that are most vital. 
go through that and then just repeat that like 12 times for the exact same case. So it's much faster. I learn what I actually need to learn, which is those key different ways to think. And then my study just becomes so much more effective. So bringing this back to math, okay? In mathematics, there are actually multiple different ways you can answer the question, okay? Typically it's maybe two or three in the past paper questions that you do, but regardless, that's two or three different ways to answer the question. So what I would do and what I would strongly suggest you do is do it your way first, right? Look at the question, do the answer, then look at the solution, and then look at some of the other solutions. And then do the question again without looking at the solution, but knowing kind of how they did it, and then try to do it that different way. And then look at the solution again, and then do it a third time, looking at a slightly different solution, all right? And then what you can even do is, let's say you like one of those questions, right? One of those questions is valuable. You can put that into its own category, right? Put that question on a Google Doc. In fact, if you have like a Google Sheet or Google Doc to like store all this, that's where you just get absolute gold, right? So put one of those questions in that Google Doc, in that Google Sheet, and then go back to it, maybe in a week time, and then do it again, do the question again your own way, and then ask yourself, what other ways can I do this that are outside of the questions? Okay, what other ways are outside of the solutions? Maybe utilizing past topics from before you got, like there's a lot of content, there's actually a lot of things that you learned before you got into the IB that can be utilized to do this, to do the question that you're working on. And you'd actually be surprised, there's some creative ways to use like eighth grade trigonometry to do some pretty interesting questions. Anyways, the point here is find different ways to do the solution, understand the key change to look at the question and then the most important part is to do volume do as much as you humanly can all right now the objection i get from most students is won't this be monotonous right the answer is yes okay the answer is yes like frankly yes it will be boring at times however i don't think of it from that way i look at it as a game in fact i look at the entire like as soon as i started looking at the ib differently i looked at the ib as just this game i had to be all right as this video game and if you approach it as a video game that you need to be it becomes so much easier not only to motivate you but also to do well okay because no longer are you trying to survive but you're looking at it as a opponent that you need to beat so when i looked at it as a game i literally set it up as a game all right so i i set up a score right i was trying to beat my ib score i also added a soundtrack behind it right every game has a good soundtrack so and you can even ask any of my friends because i was always listening to this type of music i'll just put a bunch of edm all right i would put these edm mix that my brother made or myself or just stuff i found online long story short i really like listening to progressive trance music that just put me into a state of flow and i just listened to that for hours and i was just able to reach that state of flow so quickly whether i was on the bus whether i was in a seminar room whether i was in my own room studying i was able to reach that state of flow so quickly and then just do as many questions as possible and you want to go fast through them as well don't spend like 25 30 minutes per question at least not if you're trying to build intuition if you're trying to understand the question a little bit more and then look at it from different angles absolutely but if you're trying to build intuition go at it much faster and when you're going at it faster eliminate all of the skills that you're not focusing on and just try to focus in on what is the key way that I'm trying to approach this question, right? What is one of the key takeaways? What's like the trick? What's the, the general structure? What's the biggest takeaway from that? And when you do that, when you do that at scale and scale doing a few hours every single day for a few months, right? that's what, it, that's really what it takes. That's where you achieve extraordinary results. And again, I strongly suggest you only need to study school like three to four hours a day. Okay. I do like an hour and a half on the bus in the morning, an hour and a half on the bus at home, and then just an hour at my house. So by the time 6 p.m. got, literally it was 6 p.m., okay, 6 p.m., and I had no homework to do, I had nothing. I could spend, the typically what I do for the entirety of the afternoon was work on one of my extracurriculars, right? If I was working on one of my businesses, that's what I would spend, or I would just literally chill with my friends and family, right? That's why people always ask me, it's like, how do you have so much free time? It's like, guys, it's not that hard. You literally just need to do three to four hours every single day, okay? Do that however you like, and then the rest of the time, you don't need to spend working. All right, so do those few things. Focus in on the fundamentals, volume. Remember the three-step process that we talked about, pre-study, focus in class, and then just do as many past paper questions as possible. And remember, past paper questions are IB past paper questions. You can find them online. I'm sure it's somewhere on the Reddit, it's floating around. Go find past papers, do those at scale, do those with volume, and I promise you, if you do those two things, you're gonna develop a strong strong IB math intuition, which will help you improve your score and hopefully get that level setting. All right. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comment section down below. And also let me know if you want me to do a video where I basically just do as many past paper questions as possible. I'm probably going to do that pretty soon, just so I can show you the method that I approach these questions by. And with that being said, until next time, stay grizzly. I'll see you in the next video.